Yes. Hey. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the American Society for Theater Research's Arts in Conversations conversation <laughs> uh, with Christina Anderson, Martina Mayok, uh, and Lauren Yee. Uh, round of applause again, please. Uh, and this session is being a live stream via, uh, by HowlRound. So there's a camera in the back right there. So uh, for those who are tuning in via HowlRound, we're happy to have you in this, in this space. Like, hello, hello. Uh, my name is Harvey Young, and I have the pleasure of serving as the moderator uh, for this conversation. Uh, and I want to actually take a moment to acknowledge Northwestern University, specifically the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary PhD program in theater and drama and performance studies for being a sponsor uh, for this conversation. Yeah. Yes. And so the structure for this is we have about an hour for a conversation. I'm thinking that what we'll do is we'll talk up here for about 35, 40 minutes and just open it up for a conversation with people who are here. So, so that's what we're gonna do. So if you have questions, start thinking about them. Um, what I will also do is to reserve time for that conversation, I will offer uh, quite brief uh, bios you know, of, our, of our distinguished guests here. Uh, and I want you to be aware of the fact that uh, you know, these three amazing artists, playwrights, authors, uh, they, have, they have been nominated for or won every single major award you can get in the American theater. <laughs> so, so this is my way of saying my, the, the bios would be quite brief and I had to edit it down because we could be here for an hour just uh, <laughs> talking about each of them. Uh, so, but to my left, uh, and please hold your applause until I've introduced everyone. Uh, to my left, Christina Anderson, uh, is a 2022 Tony Award nominee for Outstanding Book for the musical Paradise Square. Uh, she's a playwright, a TV writer, a screenwriter, an educator, and a creative. Uh, her plays, there's many of them, uh, such as How to Catch Creation, Black Top Sky, and The Ripple, the Wave that Carried Me Home, have been produced by many theaters, such as the Goodman Theater, uh, Berkeley Rep, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Kansas City Rep, Yale Rep, among many, many others. Her recent awards, just the recent awards, and honors includes the, the 2022 Horton Foote Prize, the 2022 Arthur Miller Legacy Award, the 2021 uh, Prince Prize, uh, as well as, um, it, it, you know, uh, in, in, in the arsenal of awards you have, uh, the Lilly Awards, uh, the Lilly Awards Harper Lee Prize. So, Christine, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, Martina is very next here. Uh, Martina was awarded the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for Drama uh, for her play, The Cost of Living, which was nominated for the Tony Award for Best Play as well. Uh, her other plays include Sanctuary City, Queens, and Ironbound, uh, which have been produced widely and across the country internationally. Uh, her other awards, and again, a long list of awards, uh, include the Arthur Miller Legacy Award, the Obie Award for Playwriting, the Hull Warner Award, the Lucille Lortel Award for Outstanding New Play, uh, there's so many more. Um, uh, Gatsby, which is a new musical uh, for which Martina wrote the libretto, will premiere this spring at American Repertory Theater. Uh, I called them up for tickets and they're like, wait, <laughs> they're not on sale yet. Uh, yeah, she has developed TV projects for HBO and is writing feature films for Plan B among other studios. Uh, and Lauren uh, is a playwright, a screenwriter, and a TV writer. Uh, you know, just in 2019, 2020, which was you know, the, the, the before times of COVID, right? You know, um, you know, she was, according to American theater, the second most produced playwright in this country, right? Uh, and, if you, and, and if you look and you follow uh, the Beyond the Reopening, you know, she has been on that list of most produced playwrights uh, consistently since then. Um, you know, her, uh, her play, Cambodian Rock Band, premiered at South Coast Rep uh, with productions at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, La Jolla Playhouse, Victory Garden, Signature Theater. Her play, The Great Leap, I'm gonna give you the two, two of many plays. Uh, it have, has been performed at the Denver Center, uh, Seattle Rep, Atlantic uh, Theater, Guthrie Theater, American Conservatory Theater, Steppenwolf, Pasadena Playhouse, East West Players, and more. Uh, she's the winner of the Doris Duke Artist Award, the Steinberg Playwright Award, the Horton Foote Prize, among many, many other awards. Uh, and her plays were the number one and number two plays on the 2017 Kilroy's Kill Kill list. So please join me in a massive round of applause. <laughs> We had, we had dinner uh, just recently, and, and the one question I asked was like, where do you keep all of your awards? Uh, I mean, it's like, it is truly staggering. 
Uh, but my first question I have is, so in 2020, uh, we witnessed uh, the rise of We See You White American Theater um, and the demands to confront the racism and prejudice uh, that exists within American theater. Uh, and now, three years later, right, you're seeing sort of a backlash, book bans, you know, a rollback of those 2020 commitments across different theaters. You know, so, you know, not only talking about sort of We See You, but just more generally, so what is your perspective and your vantage point on the state of professional theater today, you know, in the United States? Yeah. That's a softball question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of conversations yeah, yeah, at dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no big deal. What are your thoughts about theater? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. What do you see in the landscape in terms of what's happening right now? How do you feel about where we're going? I'm just relieved that the theaters are still open. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean that to be such a like a thing, yeah. but we were yeah we were we were talking about how. Uh, uh, so many people will be like, the theater's dead, it's dead, it's no more. And we're like, no, it's still alive, it's still going, we're still thriving so to, to, some, to some degree. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not a producer, so I don't, I don't, I'm not the gatekeeper. Um, all I can keep doing is making the things that I believe in and hoping that um, people will find value in them. And my job is to make them as generous and inviting, um, uh, inclusive and interesting as I possibly can. But like, ultimately, it's not up to, I don't, I don't have the keys. Um, so uh, I think it's uh, we can create the things and then also be um, uh, speak to why they matter and why people should cast them and produce them in the ways that they do. Um, but yeah, I don't have any <laughs> producerial advice because I don't have that money. <laughs> so, 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 but we we are looking at the landscape of regional theaters across the country, right? You know, how do things feel today um, relative to how they felt in 2019? Like what, what do you see that um, has changed, has shifted, you know, what remains the same? I, I mean, just to take it off, I'm sure there's more, but I think like there's a, I have a greater awareness of a lot of things down to like the little minutia of like the, what contract your actors are on or, um, you know, kind of like how, like how much are people making in these roles? And I think there's just, like at least I have a greater awareness of, I think the privilege we have like as playwrights to be able to kind of push for change. Um, and I think also being able to like, that it's in a way not our job, but also part of our job to take care of the people that are part of our projects um, and like our community. And I would say that was something that would not even have occurred to me kind of pre, pre-COVID. What are, you, what are you saying? Yeah, you know, I would say probably pre uh, We See You, I experienced a great deal of hostility because of the things that I was writing. Uh, you know, I was centering black stories, I was centering black women, um, and you know, I'd get a lot of hostility about like, no one's gonna understand this or, you know, our audience or subscribers aren't gonna get this, you should change this, what does this word mean? Uh, you know, and oddly enough, or I don't even know if it's oddly, uh, we see you happen, COVID happened, and all of a sudden everybody, uh, not everybody, but a lot more people understood what I was trying to say for the past 15 years. <laughs> um, all of a sudden it was like, oh, like, let's produce this. It was never a discussion or a question or a debate in the lit office. All of a sudden, my agents were getting calls that they want to program this. Um, you know, I got a lot of pushback about things that weren't true anymore in a lot of my plays, but after We See You and after COVID and after uh, George Floyd, um, a lot of um, uh, they, they, uh, things that they considered invisible or old were all of a sudden relevant. Uh, so that was probably like my personal biggest um, uh, experience that I experienced. Uh, and then also I was trusted more as a dramatist, uh, which I guess, and I only bring these up because I wasn't entirely sure that that was happening pre these things. Um, uh, because it was, uh, you know, I would get talked out of a lot of things or talked down from a lot of things. Uh, and so, but I always felt like uh, it was happening, but I couldn't pinpoint it. And so, you know, after COVID and 
uh, we see you, and it was a collective vocal noise about the mistreatment or the looking the other way. Um, now all of a sudden everybody can see my work. Uh, and, and, and I don't mean, I don't say that to discount uh, like the countless people who have been very supportive of me uh, for many, many years. They buoyed me in a lot of ways and I'm still grateful for them and I often talk about them. But for me personally in my work and the things that I'm trying to do on the American stage, like that was probably the biggest thing that I noticed. And, and all of you write for television, and I've written for television uh, and, and film and developing a variety of projects. Uh, and of course, the Writers Guild strike, you know, just, you know, it settled and it looks like the SAG uh, contract was approved by the board, right, by 86% 80, of the board. Uh, you know, so what is, so uh, Lauren, we were talking about this earlier today, but maybe if you could sort of offer some insights in terms of, you know, the work you're doing right now, what is it like, you know, like, you know how do you build a writer's room, you know, can you share a bit of information and sort of storytelling here? about your work related to television? Yeah, um, I mean, I will say, to me, the biggest difference between what I do in theater and what I do in TV, I mean, one, it's the ownership, right? Like, in theater, it is your thing. You get to do, you know, hopefully, whatever you want to do with it, and if nobody wants to make it, that's, you know, like, totally fine. <laughs> and in, and in, TV, it's, uh, you know, you may be the creator, you may be developing it, but in general, you, someone else owns it and you have become an employee on your own story. And so, you know, just the expectations and the process, um, you know, becomes much different. You, be you get on this kind of like timeline that they've decided is the process. Um, and you know, you're, I think it's interesting because um, there was a point where I realized the notes process as I understood it in theater where you work with a dramaturg or sometimes you even work with the artistic director and they'll have like notes for you is very different than um, the notes process between you as a TV and film person uh, you know, you and your executives. Like there was a point where you realize you're like, oh, these notes aren't thoughts, they're instructions. <laughs> I was like, they're instructions and it's your job to figure out how you're gonna implement their instructions or try to get around their instructions. Um, so I, you know, it's just, it's just like an interesting different contrast. Um, but I think one of the things that I've gotten to in in, like I was a kind of afraid of, but have also enjoyed working in TV, uh, is that in TV, um, and you know, Harvey and I were discussing this, like in a way it's, be you're becoming, you're a writer, but you're also expected to be a manager, where, you, where you're, you know, getting into roles of leadership, and you have to think about things like the budget, or the hiring process, or a lot of things that I didn't have to take responsibility for as much in theater. And so, you know, it's just like an interesting thing to be like the leader of kind of a corporation or a community and having more responsibility in deciding like, what is your work culture? Who are you hiring? Um, you know, like just like as I've gone on in my career as a playwright, I've realize just how much more privilege I have to kind of change things. And that responsibility, I think, just continues into the TV work where, you know, you basically are just becoming an employer and a supervisor for many, many people. Yeah. And, and, and also, you know, all of you uh, have worked with musicals and, 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 and created musicals, right? You know, so Paradise Square, uh, you're, you're doing a, a wrinkle in time right now. I'm assuming mm -hmm. you're working on Gatsby. Uh, can you talk about your process in terms of you know how you approach uh, sort of developing a book through a musical differently than uh, than one of the dramas? It sounds like a, a mix somewhere in between television and playwriting. There's musicals <laughs> where there's like you are also getting in, no instructions, but they're a little because they can't legally change a word of. The, what you write in the theater, you're like, man, ooh, this is a suggestion now. Uh, whereas, like, they will own your soul in television and film, and it can change, can change whole things without your permission, which is what you sign up for, um, for delicious, delicious health insurance. Um, uh, but I have 
well, two things on the music. I, I started working on Gatsby during the pandemic, um, and I found it I found it really difficult to create original work during that time because I was still very much in it. Um, and so uh, for the past few years, I've been doing adaptations, and that has been a lovely way for me to talk about now without having to um, pull from things that might be more autobiographical. I feel like I have a co-writer in the ghost of F. Scott Fitzgerald with me to sort of respond to, uh, and that's helped me be more creative within very specific limitations, and I've, I've actually really loved that. Um, it's also um, wonderfully less lonely. I, I hate writing so much, I hate it. Um, it's, I don't like sitting for too long, like being in a room by myself and mining my own demons to or orchestrate them into an arc for other people that's legible and generous feels like agony, um, but I do it to be in the rehearsal room and to collaborate with other people, and so making a musical, there'll be somebody else in the agony with me, and they're the composer <laughs> <laughs> and the lyricist, and so it's nice to have somebody in that creative muck and beauty at the, you know, er earlier on, um, uh, 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 you know, whether it's the ghost of Escott Fitzgerald or Florence Welch, like there, that there's somebody collaborating with you, it just feels less lonely, and I really, I really enjoyed that process. And, yeah, musicals are fun, and people actually want to see them, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Christina, you know, what, what about you? you know, like, what is your thought in terms of, of, of the, the reach and the impact of the musical uh, as a form? Yeah, well, you know, I think I had a bit of a unique experience because, uh, you know, I was brought on to work on a book of a musical, and then the pandemic hit, and then... Uh, it was lifted and all of a sudden they were like, we have a rehearsal room in Chicago, we're going into rehearsal. Uh, and this was at a time where I wasn't even sure the theater was gonna come back because we had just experienced the pandemic and the world shut down. Uh, and there was still a lot of fear. Uh, and you know, Paradise Square was a huge musical. We had a lot of people in it. And I cannot describe to you the feeling of sitting in that first rehearsal with the dance number. Mm. Uh, and the actors and the performers are all in masks. Um, and the rehearsal room wasn't that big. And there was something, uh, I don't even have the adjectives for it, but to, to be in a space where you didn't know if we were gonna come back and what coming back was going to look and feel like. And then to see, to sit in a room with all these super talented people, I felt like it was fame. Like everybody knew how to dance, everybody knew how to sing. And they were in front of me like practicing this choreography. Um, and then I was like, oh, this is like a unique experience. No one else, or I imagine at least, no one else who's alive right now has experienced a pandemic and then experienced theater coming back uh, in, in, in a certain capacity. And so that probably was um, the most uh, like awakening moment about how important and necessary live performance is. Uh, and how much skill and talent, and right now, I believe, even more so bravery it takes uh, to get up there every night um, and to people who are running the house uh, and dealing with people who have been in lockdown. And uh, it's just a lot of bravery and compassion uh, that's unprecedented uh, in us coming back. And I think that was the biggest surprise for me in working on the musical. And, and, and Lauren, what approach are you taking? Uh, say that again? What approach are you taking? With, you know, with a wrinkle in time? Uh, I think there's something so great and impossible about like the book Wrinkle in Time um, that, that I think was like a fun challenge. Like I think to me, the, like the, in a way the musical that I wouldn't know how to write is like the, like the movie where everything's kind of plotted out already for you. I would be like, why are we doing it? Or like, why does there need to be a musical when there's already a movie that like does it so well? And I think, you know, like Wrinkle in Time did, ha did have a, um, you know, a, a movie version recently. And there were just like some things about it that I was like, oh, I see how you could put that on stage and possibly just t like tell that metaphor in a way that might hit differently. Um, and so I, I think it was like a, a really cool, fun challenge. Um, and I think um, just doing it with our composer, Heather Christian, has been like such a gift because there's something in her music 
that already makes you feel like you're traveling through, like it's hurtling through space and time. Mm -hmm. And so all I have to do is help us get to those places and set up those songs. There's something just like incredibly satisfying in you know, like how economical it is. And I mean this in a very genuinely positive way that it almost feels like a math problem sometimes when you're like the book writer, yes. that you're not, you're not supposed to be the fireworks and there's something kind of nice in allowing a collaborator to like be and the music to be the fireworks and just being like, okay, my job is to figure out which, which themes we're you know, covering in our story, how we get from point A to point B, how to do it fast, how to get us in in like two and a half hours. And it just feels like different muscles at the gym. I don't, I don't know if either of you are musicians. Mm -hmm. I am not. Mm -mm. And so, nope. like, it is the coolest fucking yeah. thing to make music. <laughs> yeah. And it's the most, like, proximal to coolness I can yeah. ever get. Like, when these people come in and they are levitating these dancers off of the fucking floor mm -hmm. and singing while they do it, mm -hmm. with the full face of makeup, I'm just like, this is amazing. Like, look at what the human body can do. And it's so... <laughs> thrilling it feels like being a child of like oh my god oh wow like, like, this is so great and you're like right this is like the pure joy of being in a room with people who are like g gifting you the fullness of their humanity for a generous story to like take part in in the evening it's like so pure yeah and then and, and then also when you're watching orchestration uh and then you go from someone just playing a piano to having the whole orchestra come in and then what's the word for when they just play the, the strobe yes I had no idea what was happening. <laughs> and so I go down in the room and it's like a rock concert. And like the actor's are like, you better go girl, you know? So like, and then I'm screwed, cause I love cellos. I've studied it for years. Like I'm a, yeah, I love cellos. And there was a black girl who was playing a cello and I was like, go girl, go, <laughs> you know? And like, it's just like, cause uh, yeah. Cause you know, after working on plays so long and it's a mm -hmm. lot of like, you know, doing this word and feeling this moment and doing this blocking and all of a sudden you just got a bass player who's in front of you like <laughs> playing the shit out of a line and you're just like, oh, wow. I mean, it is really unbelievable. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that, was that was pretty good. Uh, so, so this room, uh, the American Society for Theater Research, uh, like everyone who's sitting here, uh, they're forces. Uh, you, know, the, you know, it's educators, it's scholars, it's critics, it's theorists, it's people who are historians who write about theater, who write about performance in everyday life. Uh, they're educators who teach the next generation of, of, of artists as critics and also as um, uh, theater makers as well. Uh, so this is a force in this room. This is a force in this room. And, and what I want to ask you is when you're thinking about not the world of journalism and, and critics, right? Like that, uh, I, 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 I have many friends who are critics, I adore them too. Um, you know, but you know, my, my question is when we think, when you think about your body of work and the way that people engage your work in, in, in terms of writing and teaching and sharing, um, are there sort of plays of yours that you wish maybe the spotlight could shift toward, um, you know, as a way of offering a different perspective on your work? You know, are there misconceptions you've noticed that people might have about your work that you could, you might want to clarify? <laughs> yeah, who should we like rock her scissor? Uh, I feel like I've been asked a lot about casting, um, specifically uh, uh, how, how to cast disabled actors, and I'm like, you just cast them. Um, <laughs> anything else? Um, uh, but I wish I was asked more about like structure, nerdy things that I really like, like time, how to organize time and space, particularly for immigrants for somebody who maybe had a before and an after, had a BC, you know, uh, BCAD, whatever. Um, uh, I just like nerding out about structure and craft and things like that that I think I tend to get off to be asked about. Um, uh, yeah, the, the producerial things that like are, uh, uh, end up being larger topics of discussion in American theater, which are important to have, it seems, because um, as, as advanced as we feel like we are, we are not, so we could do better. Um, but yeah, I like the nerdy stuff. Talking about time, <laughs> structure. I mean, I, I, I was like, if we're talking about nerdy stuff, I, I was like, I love hearing about process. Just like, uh, like, like in terms of like how how writers write and like how like 
what my process is and like literally kind of like, do I use a paper and pen or do I use it on the laptop? And like, um, I'm intensely interested in kind of like the conditions under which um, like m my best work has come out because I feel like the more that I've gotten to learn about myself as a writer, the more I'm able to like articulate with collaborators and theaters, like this is actually what I need yeah. to do to do my best work, and I know that because just like I've ex I've you know observed it over time, yeah, kind of like best practices, because um, some of it like is not necessarily expensive or you know like costs anything. It's just like the ways in which you know you kind of put together the collaboration. Um, I think I think I'm. I wish I could talk, or I wish like I had to do fewer things on like on the producing side yeah. of like the the marketing or kind of like making sure that the play was being represented in the best way. And I wish I could talk more about um, I don't know like like kind of community. I don't know. It kind of doesn't quite quite fit into your question, um, but I feel like it's relevant. Because I think when I write a play, I always ask who it's for. Um, and I mean that maybe in the broad sense, I feel like everyone should come to all the plays. Um, but frequently when I write a play, I will think of one person, that, and that may be a real person, or it may be just kind of like a fictitious person I make up in my mind. Um, and that is something that helps guide me towards what is like the right experience of what this play is. And so I think like the community aspect of it is important to me. Like my earliest plays were kind of like me and my friends in high school and us trying to like create these, you know, original plays for our friends and family. And so like from my earliest days, I've always thought about like, well, who is it actually for? Yeah, yeah well, you know, I've had the pleasure of being here since Thursday uh, and talking with many of you and uh, uh, you all are very smart. <laughs> uh, and I, I also appreciate because, you know, I often travel with a very heavy book bag because uh, book I have books and my laptop and stuff and I've seen so many heavy book bags <laughs> and, and heavy totes and I feel like my people, you know. <laughs> um, and also, you know, I do a ton of research for my plays. Um, and you know, like I love JSTOR. It's like, uh, and, and I feel like part of the only reason I teach is just so I can have access to libraries, um, and you know, to help the youth and stuff. Um, but uh, you know, I love librarians. Um, you know, like one of my early trainings as a playwright was by a professor who uh, encouraged us to look at scholarly articles and figure out how to um, dramatize those pieces. Um, so I've been trained in that since I was like 19, 20. Um, and so I guess I would say uh, that, uh, cause like sometimes I feel like with black plays, it's an assumption that it happened to that playwright mm -hmm. or it happened to who that, somebody that that playwright knows. Um, and while I feel like a lot of my, a bod the body of my work is an emotional biography, uh, there's very little, um, that actually happened to me or anyone that I know, uh, because I'm very interested in uh, history and time and systems, American systems, and how uh, black folks navigate those systems, um, regardless of who constructed them or not. Um, and so I would, I guess I would just say, um, to just like not make an assumption that it's autobiographical, right. uh, and to uh, look at the piece uh, as a as a piece of dramatic work, mm -hmm. um, and because I'm very interested in placing my plays in historical context, yeah. uh, but you know if I've done my job correctly, you don't feel like you're watching a history piece. You you're watching human beings uh, go through life. Uh, I'm a big believer that history is created by human beings, uh, whether we were successful at it or not. Uh, and so I try to put that on the American stage. Um, I think it's really important to 
because uh, you know it's so funny when you when you sent us that question about the critics. I thought you meant like journalists, and I don't read my reviews. My partner reads all of them, uh, <laughs> and so I asked her, well, like, what should I say? Um, and so she gave me a list of all these awesome things to say that I don't know why because you're talking about scholars. Uh, but what, what, um, what would you say? Uh, yeah. Well, okay, so here's what I was saying. <laughs> the reason that I stopped reading reviews uh, is because I wasn't really sure what I was doing, but I knew that I was really committed to putting something in Ameri on the American stage, um, and particularly black women on the American stage, uh, in a way um, that I had seen glimpses of um, and that I was inspired to create. Um, and I knew that if I kept reading my reviews, um, it would derail me from the work I was trying to do because of hurt feelings. Uh, and so I stopped reading good or bad reviews very early on. Um, and so my partner, who's very loving and supportive, she reads all of them. And then sometimes <laughs> if there's a particular uh, review by a black woman, she would be like, you should really read this, <laughs> you know? Um, but she said one of the things is that with my body of work, if you feel uncomfortable or uncertain, like question that, um, not necessarily my ability as a dramatist, uh, be in conversation with um, what the play is asking you more than my skill mm. as a dramatist. So that's what I would say. Uh, and, and we're gonna transition soon to to questions, so this is this is your prompt too. <laughs> think about the questions you're going to have. Uh, I want to ask about a meaningful mentoring moment that you, that you've had personally, like in terms of a, a moment in your lives, you know, where someone sort of came along and um, impacted you in some way that sort of positively helped you uh, on your journey as an artist. Mm. I wonder if you share that. I remember uh, one of my mentors in grad school, UC San Diego, Adele Shank. Um, I remember like the, the piece of advice that she gave, uh, other than being like totally badass and always being like, Look, people don't know anything, you're fine, um, <laughs> is, is that she was like, always keep champagne in your refrigerator. Because mm. <laughs> yeah. she, she was like, you're, you know, it's a hard road. When good things happen, you should always celebrate it. You should always celebrate it because, you know, you never know when you're gonna get that again. And, I, and so for a while, like for a long time, like I kept a bottle of champagne in the fridge. And I think I kept being too precious about like what was worth getting it out <laughs> of the, the fridge. So like by the time I got it, I, I think it was like no longer good. Um, but basically I think I should have taken her advice and like just celebrate it more. Um, that is, that's what I got. <laughs> that is so nice. Yeah. There, this is, um, I feel like the public school teachers who did not get paid enough um, to, to give the gift of their attention as generously as they did or I, I, um, I, I grew up with a lot of domestic violence and um, when I first started, um, I, I would, I, the way my, my tactic to deal with that is I would lock myself in my room you know, for hours and just kind of stay out of the way uh, and um, do homework and like quiet things and so I get assignments in school to like write two pages and I'd come up with like 25 uh, and these poor teachers were like, this is great but um, they don't pay us enough. And uh, so there was one teacher who was like, well, what, will, what will we do with this energy and this desire to communicate and create? And so she found a playwriting competition in um, uh, elementary school. And I didn't know what a play was. I thought it was a movie you couldn't afford to make. <laughs> <laughs> Not untrue. Um, but so I like wrote a play um, and uh, she stayed after school every day for hours, this, this teacher to, I, I like acted it for her. I acted it after school um, and it was her, like she chose to give her time in this way so generously and um, so she not only, I mean she was literally giving me a safe space also, like there was a place that I could be for a few hours after school that wasn't my home and just like the gift of her attention um, made me feel so worthy 
And I think that that, like these ways that, that teachers will go out of their, especially public school teachers, who will go out of their way and can see, I don't know if this teacher knew it was going on at home or not, but like either way she, um, I think she kept, she in some ways really kept me alive. And I think I held on to that, that maybe if there was one person that was willing to listen, maybe more would. Um, so I think she, she and other teachers um, so this sort of season that way, and I'll be forever grateful for, for them. So, public school teachers, <laughs> yes, bless. Yeah, uh, I don't know. The only thing I can think of is when I was first learning playwriting, I had a teacher in high school who was like, you know, if you put in the stage directions, they're drinking water, somebody has to say this water is good, or else there won't be water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, and it's so funny because I still think of that teacher because sometimes I'll be writing dialogue and I'm like, oh, this prop is important, you know? And then I always put in that dummy line of like, that broom is nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, any kind of, somebody complimenting any kind of prop on stage is like my dummy line to remember that that prop is important. <laughs> yeah. That was great. Was great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all right, let's open it up. Uh, see if uh, there's 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 mics uh, being run around. So uh, I'll let I trust. I, I have to call. Do I? Uh, like Amy, I trust you. No. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, a huge admirer of all your work. So this is just a joy. Um, since we're talking about mentorship in conversations of kind of theatricality, I'm really curious. Who do you imagine your work in conversation with? It's something we talk to our students a lot about is the legacies of playwriting and how things move across time. And I'm just really kind of fascinated by who are playwrights who you imagine yourself in conversation with, who you are perhaps challenging in ways, who you are perhaps responding to in ways, contemporary or past. But I'm just really intrigued by that idea of, of kind of longer legacies of mentorship, perhaps. You know, can I, like, I, when you first asked that question, I, I was like, I wasn't thinking about playwrights at all. I was thinking about the, the little like working class kids, like little first gen kids who like might get these plays and be like, me too. Maybe I can like find it. When you were talking about process, like wanting to know how playwrights make, you know, make, I was like, that would be such a great gift to, to compile and demystify like the making of this because most of us like don't know what the fuck we're doing uh, or we're trying to figure out as we go. And so I, I like, that was the first thing I thought of was like the was like the, the playwrights that will be that will be coming that will that will hopefully be able to tell their the, the stories of their moms and the stories of like you know being being a weird first gen kid or you know or or, or not having enough not having enough food or money to, to live with and so yeah I don't know that's what I that's what I if I can cheat on your question <laughs> <laughs> I think Everybody I'll cheat okay. too. <laughs> And I'll also say uh, Patricia Hill Collins, Black Feminist Thought. Uh, I read that when I was 19 and it flipped my world upside down and it defined the early half of my body of work. Uh, Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni, uh, Wallace Shawn, uh, a lot of his solo work um, and his world building has taught me a lot. Uh, Sam Shepard's early plays, um, Paula Vogel, Lynn Models. Um, and Kazaki Shange, I took a class freshman year of college where we helped her adapt Lillian into a stage play. And I learned, uh, you know, because I was trained under Aristotle in a well-made play when I was in high school. And I'll never forget this, the first day of class, like we sitting, I was the only freshman in that class and Shange was like, this is how this class gonna work. <laughs> and you know, we're gonna, we gonna read a chapter out loud every class and then we'll talk about how to adapt it. And I was like, excuse me, Professor Sean Gay. Like, first of all, we need an exciting incident. <laughs> Second of all, we need a protagonist who has an obstacle. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me, cigarette in hand, and she was like, that's not how I make theater. And I was like, okay. And we spent that semester and she totally just flipped my world upside down. Mm -hmm. So Shange as a theater maker yeah. uh, and as a live action performance maker has also taught me a great deal. So that's what I would say. Mm. Oh, I mean, I, th I think for me, there, I mean, there's obviously like, um, I feel like contemporary playwrights that like who, who I know and who I admire. I was like the Lynn Nottages. <laughs> like Rajiv Joseph, Juliet Cho, um, 
And then, then I also feel like there's all these kind of um, like childhood influences that I grew up with that, um, you know, that like I'm a kid of the 90s and like the pop culture, I watched a lot of television. Um, and so I think I think about like the ways in which like, you know, there there's kind of like all the contemporary playwrights, but it's also like my work is in conversation with Sesame Street and my work is in conversation with like, you know, like all the commercials of the 90s. And I don't, I don't know, it's just like, it's, it's, I don't know, it's like, it's kind of like wide and, uh, and varied, yeah. Oh. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. I teach at the University of Washington in Seattle. And so I've been trying to teach in dialogue with plays that are happening in the city. So Lauren Yeh was really excited. I brought my students to Cambodian Rock Band. And Thank next you. quarter, I'm gonna bring students to Sanctuary City at Seattle Rep. Um, and so it's, it's an honor to teach your plays. And so I'm curious for all three of you, what do you want us to know as professors who teach your plays? Like what's helpful for us to tell our students when we teach your plays and when we bring students to your plays? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, just just like just like thinking about the the play that you took your students to see, um, I, I I always like the idea of like an action step after a play, and that can be kind of as like concrete or intangible um, as you know as that may be. Uh, yeah, like like I feel like if my plays are in dialogue with people in that it moves them to do X thing, um, then I've succeeded. Um, I think for Kimberly Rock Band, it's like if I can make you a fan of the music or you can feel like you're more immersed in the world and you wanna know more about it, then I feel like I've succeeded. Um, I feel like, uh, yeah, in, in terms of like how I want them to experience it, I don't know, do, I was like, anybody else have? <laughs> like, as I think about it. I feel like it's, um, where do you find yourself in it? Um, uh, we, I think we're just so much more alike than we are dissimilar. Um, and for some of, I remember people talking about Sanctuary City as like, oh, it's about dreamers, oh, it's about undocumented. And I'm like, yeah, but it's about friendships and people go to prom. And about your, you know, your, your, your person that you, that knows you better than, than your own mother. Um, and that that core relationship that you that, that that you have that's not romantic love, but it's but it's deep love. And um, how uh, where are they where are they finding themselves in stories that might not uh, on the surface feel like they represent their their own, um, or on the on the opposite is like look this is a story that represents that represents your experience. And so if they're playwriting students, then I would I I would ask them what's the What's the thing that if they if they didn't write it down they would regret and and they died tomorrow what would they regret not having said what is the thing that matters mo so much uh, uh, to them what is the, the that core experience of living in the world that they feel like only they know that they have to share with the world and just imagine that your next play may always be your last play and and um, I, I think that that's that's like a that's an approach I've 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 taken to. Uh, Every other, every play I've written next is like, well, I'm gonna, since I'm going to die tomorrow, what's the thing that I need to, in, to that I want to share so that I feel less lonely, um, and uh, and I feel like th there's a, there's an act of reaching, and so what in them makes them want to reach, uh, and where are they, uh, w w what do they want to share? So I don't, it's more of a playwriting question, but yes, I think that's that. But thank you for taking me to the place. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I guess I would just say, um, how can it only be a play? Like, how can it only be a piece of theater? Uh, you know, like I really, uh, like with my work, I really strive to have it wholly exist as a piece of live performance that's extremely ephemeral. Um, and to also really celebrate uh, live performance um, and being in an audience with a group of people and experience a moment that will never happen again. Uh, and just really having conversations about theatricality and spectacle um, and uh, celebrating live performance. Because, you know, I really do believe we almost lost it. 
And so just constantly um, having that conversation uh, with the students and also encouraging them to make noise, uh, not like in a disrespectful way, uh, but laugh if they want to laugh. If they know what song is playing, sing it. Um, you know, if they have like a visceral reaction to it, vocalize it. Um, uh, I think that's also important too. And to also encourage those young folks that, uh, to bring their family. If, Cause you know, I've had a lot of young people see my shows on school trips mm -hmm. and then they take their parents or you know, they'll take their uh, like friends who couldn't go. Um, and so also reminding them that they have access to those spaces outside of school, I think is important too. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, I'm witnessing a lot of loss and grief and scarcity in the nonprofit theater world and, and also what does it mean for, for us to develop new work. So I'm interested in how you navigate this kind of increasing mode of scarcity in the nonprofit theater world and, and, and how do you continue to you know, dream and, and practice abundance in the midst of that kind of scarcity. Thank you. Practice abundance, that's a beautiful way of phrasing that. <laughs> I, um, a lot of our new play development places like The Lark um, have been decimated by the pandemic. And these places where so often you're the only playwright in the rehearsal, you're, you're, you're the only playwright in the rehearsal room and of course you're doing television room, but it's um, a lot of the spaces in which we would meet to share our strangeness. Um, and then be able to move past that to just create as well as like here's my here's my strange and co-ate pages and get, you know sharing them with somebody else and being celebrated and getting being able to move on to the next day have been have are gone now. Um, I realized how much how important community was um, the, the past because of the absence of it and so um, I think a lot of us have been putting together our own rooms like uh, um, I replicated a lark program where we would just like meet for two, I gathered like six playwrights and we met for for two weeks. We, Natasha Sinha gave us like sp space for free at the at Playwrights Horizons when they weren't rehearsing a show. We all brought some Costco snacks. Like we brought in 10 pages of, of new plays and, and, and would meet for three hours a day for, for two weeks. Um, and the first like 45 minutes of every session we were just weeping because we'd, we'd missed it so much. Um, and uh, I think that in terms of things that are scarce, it feels like safe spaces to create outside of a producerial eye, outside of that audition process when you do a reading, um, are, are, are rare. And, I, and I, uh, I have been a part of, and I've seen a lot of people just making their own, their own versions of these things that have been taken away. Um, that we've that we've lost. I mean, not to mention the like loss of life and all of these things that we're that we're holding in our bodies and in our memories. But um, specifically, administratively, and you know, uh, as a as a um, an art form and a, I don't know, all of it. Um, I feel like we're all, we're having to get really grassroots about stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I would say uh, kind of like my journey through the pandemic uh, has also been coupled with like my journey into like parenthood. And so like I've, I've come out of it just like a very different person with very, has like just a very different schedule. Um, and so I think like one of the things I've done to kind of combat, you know, the, the pandemic related losses, you know, that we've had of like our theater development spaces and also kind of like my new life is like, oh, I, like, I, don't, I don't do late nights. <laughs> anymore um, is that like I've kind of organized for instance like AAPI artist picnics where I think it's just kind of compensating for the fact that I was like I don't see people kind of as much as I used to some of those places are gone some of those places um, you know just don't exist anymore and so just trying to replicate what I feel like I'm missing and making it a space that is as flexible as some of those spaces used to be where um, there doesn't need to be so much of an agenda. You can show up, you don't have to know anybody. Uh, you get to meet people. Um, I feel like that's the way that I've, I've kind of coped with it. Uh, that's a, well, I don't know. 
oh, I've been making a lot of music. So, uh, and then also, um, also just being truthful that it's scary and that it hurts. And I have a lot of colleagues who I came up with who are now running theaters and uh, it's really hard to watch a lot of people who I think are very brilliant um, to get this opportunity to run these institutions uh, and either they're ended or they're in having really hard times. Because uh, I think, um, yeah, that they're just brilliant people and it really uh, hurts my heart to see them have to deal with some real tough moments uh, when I think they have a lot of really important things to say uh, to audiences as ADs and directors. Um, so uh, I've, I've been a little, I don't know how to answer the abundance question because uh, it, it, it's not where I'm at right now. Um, but uh, but it, it does bring me solace that there's so many brilliant people like many of you in this room who are showing up every day um, and doing the work and asking the hard questions and also hopefully all taking care of yourselves as well and drinking the tea and getting the sleep and all those <laughs> human things as well. And here, um, stage right. Um, thank you, Icons, for your words and wisdom. Um, my question is, um, what advice might you have for early career playwrights, aspiring screenwriters, um, who, are who are trying to find homes for their work um, and also want their work um, to be protected in a way? Um, I guess my question is, what do you know now in your career that you wish you had known early in your career about, oh, this is who I want to produce my work with, this is who I want to go to, um, and this is how I want my story to be told? I guess I would say, because uh, I'm working with uh, some of the playwrights at uh, YSD, and um, you know, the thing that I tell them uh, is to not necessarily be interested in the institution, but be interested in uh, your process as a writer, because that's really the only thing you can, or in my opinion at least, that's the only thing you can really control, uh, is what you're trying to say with the work and uh, what kind of conversations you're trying to have. And that's not to say that you have to have these heavy conversations and make like these big statements. It's just like, what kind of theater do you want to make? Uh, and um, because it's been my experience, like I've worked in lit offices as an intern and like all these things. And a lot of times, I love you ADs, but a lot of times it's just like, they don't know what they're looking at until they see it. Uh, or um, sometimes they're super influenced by the coast and they'll produce things based off of that. Uh, but I would just say as an early career playwright, just figure out what it is, like the conversation you wanna have with your work. Uh, and then a lot of times the people who are meant to be in conversation with you will gravitate towards you. Uh, and you will also gravitate towards certain people because you're clear about what you're trying to do. Yeah. I would co-sign on that. Like find your people, um, uh, know how to talk about your work because if you don't, then somebody else will talk about it for you. Uh, and, and that's annoying. Because you're just like part of, part of the, I mean, I'm part, part of the process of writing is like you don't know what you, are, you uh, it's essentially writing about what you don't know about what you know. You know, you're going through the process to, to to come to understand something, but then at the end of it, you have to then speak for it. And that's, uh, you know, maybe, I think that falls away after a certain time, but from, the, from, from jump, it was like, uh, know that your part-time job is um, being social. Go like go to the readings, go to the openings. And make some get, get a friend who's like going to all the openings and go go with them because because the ages would be there because the lit managers would be there. Go up to them and be like, hi, I'm you know this is my name and like this is a genuine thing that I feel about your theater, what you do. If it's you know like don't lie, <laughs> um, find out what's out there. Even if you know it, 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 there's things to see for free. Get educated about the, the the places that are doing the work that you respond to and make relationships there. Um, go. Uh, like find playwrights bios and look at all the awards and fellowships they won and apply for them. <laughs> See like what, they, cause you, I didn't even know what the hell was out there. So I just would like go on, go on bios and be like, oh, is this, can I apply, am I eligible? And then just like make that, make that Excel sheet of like when this is due, when that is due. Like it is the, um, what I didn't know about being a playwright start, starting out was how much of a business it was that you had to run, like you had to, you had to guard your, your that, that, that part of your soul and your brain that creates 
And then there was an aspect of like the doer, the mover, the shaker, um, because a lot of it is relationships that, that, are, that, are, that are genuine, that you, 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 bond, you bond with somebody who makes something that speaks to you and they, and they make something that's, that, 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 you know, vice versa, if no around. Um, and um, you're just trying to find each other and lift each other up. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's an aspect of like, n like networking is a hot word, but like, it's just, you're trying to find your friends, whether they're gonna be in the rehearsal room with you or getting you to the rehearsal room, like so much of this is relationships and, and knowing how to talk about what, you, what your intention is um, to them. Uh, uh, I think, yeah, and then you have, you'll have like, lots of friends. It'd be great. <laughs> I mean, I, I was like, all of this. <laughs> and also, I think just like do a lot of stuff. I feel like the first time like I wrote a play that I thought was good, I was like, oh, like I have this one play. And then you would send it in the theater, be like, well, send us, this is not right, but send us like your next plan. I'd be like, but I don't have another <laughs> play. <laughs> and so, and just just learning to like create and be like, okay, ma you know, maybe something will come up with this one, but like let's keep going or like submit to contest and then just forget about it and then like do uh -huh. more, you know. So I think just like always, kind of be moving through it um, and and don't get stuck on like this is my only thing or this is my one opportunity and if it doesn't work. Um, because there's, there's just gonna be a lot of stuff that you're gonna be making. So we have about three minutes left. Um, so let's try to get in a couple more questions and then maybe one person can respond. We can yep. maybe get more questions in. Hi, I'm Quanda Johnson. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, my dissertator there. Uh, a lot of dramatists start out as poets. And I'm just really curious if any of you started out uh, writing that way through your exploring uh, poetry mm. at first. Uh, can I, yeah, I did a lot of spoken that. word. Uh, that was my entryway in. Uh, uh, I, I did forensics. I don't know if people mm. are familiar yeah. with that. Yeah. Oh, nice, okay. <laughs> okay. Because usually people are like, criminology? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I did solo, uh, 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 humorous monologue, um, and uh, also did a lot of spoken word, Jessica Caramore, like Saul Williams, uh, so that was my entryway in. I remember in seventh grade, we all got a copy of For Colored Girls, and we were all like, you know, there was nowhere, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, that's how I got started with performing live, was through spoken word and monologues. Yes, um, thank you so much for this wonderful event. Um, am I on? You're yeah. on? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Alrighty, um, so Christina, I saw Good Goods um, in 2012, the night that Whitney Houston passed, and it was so beautiful to see oh, it that wow. night. Um, but Martina, I wanted to ask you, um, back to the question about influences, because I see a lot of kinship between your work and Lynn Nottage's work. Because you both tell these stories of like working class <laughs> people. <laughs> and I, I was wondering if you felt connected to her as a playwright. <laughs> um, can I share that first bit? So we share the same agent. Um, and when my, when my agent, who I love very much, this is his love language, when he wants to piss me off, um, he will cut me off mid-sentence and go, I'm sorry, my two-time Pulitzer Prize winner is calling me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> referring to Lynn Nottage. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, she was, we, she was our teacher at, at YSD. And, I think that she's one of the most brilliant fucking minds, um, and is also so, some, similar to her, like her, Dominique and Mariso. There are these, there are these, these makers that are also um, deeply invested in in, in actually changing the world in, in, in ways that they that by by going out into communities and, and going out and and and, and doing um, organizing and advocacy that I respect so much. With, even if that advocacy is just on social media, that they they are so committed. Um, and are, are not inspiring to me, and I think that, um, uh, my God, if I can get, get put into a sentence with Lynette, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm very moved. Um, I, I think um, I, she, she, I, I read her forward to the Arthur Miller um, uh, collection a few years, a few years ago, and she wrote about, how, uh, you know, his, his commitment to the, you know, the, the, the common man as king, and I think that maybe if there's a parallel, it's that. Uh, I mean, all of us on, on, on the stage right now make, make work that are the people that we grew, grew up with, people that we are, that haven't traditionally been on, been on stages as prevalently as others, 
and then having them be center stage and, and seeing their lives as royalty and at that level of dignity and, and integrity um, that I think I was, uh, I saw, I saw in, in Lynn's work and she's a master architect. Uh, she's just, she knows how to build a cathedral of drama that I like look up, that I look up to so, so much. Thank you. So to wind this down, uh, I just want to say a couple things. The first is um, uh, you three are, are truly amazing. You're Absolutely amazing. extraordinary. Uh, I mean, the work that you do um, not only uh, sort of transforms like theaters all across the US, all around the world, you also inspire people uh, to explore and engage, you know, not only sort of a sense of humanity through your work, uh, but also to enter the arts, you know, themselves, you know, and it's, uh, when the, the words you use to describe Lynn Nottage, you know, as a person who, you know, has built this structure, right, that has um, uh, inspired people and welcomed people in, that's the work that you are doing. Uh, and just to give you a sense of their generosity um, uh, as people, right, you know, it's like when I, when I sent emails to say, uh, you know, would you come, right, uh, they responded immediately, right, without hesitation, uh, like literally within a few minutes. Um, and you know you're, you 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 walk the walk, uh, you uh, inspire me in particular. You inspire all these people in this room, you know. And all these people in this room represent like a lot of more people because we're all we're, we all represent different schools and departments and stuff like that. So each person here is probably like another like like hundred, right? You know, uh, and that is your impact. Uh, so I just want a round of applause. Uh, for that. And, and, and for the folks who happen to be like watching this via HowlRound, uh, the American Society for Theater Research is a fantastic organization that you yeah. should be a member of. Uh, so, so, so look it up online. Their conference will be next year in Seattle. Uh, it's great conversations like this that happen at ASTR uh, every single day. Um, so we're going to break right now. There is a wonderful reception in honor of our Distinguished Scholar Award winners and the larger community of those who have invested their time and energy in support of this organization. It's a festive celebration of people who are committed to scholarship and community. Uh, so let's all go to that venue, <laughs> you know, uh, and then thank you again. So one last round of applause. Thank you. Can we thank you for your care?